Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a warm welcome to Ewan Stewart.
primary importance of the rule of law. Britain enjoys that rule of law. I think the habeas corpus, the common law, is under very significant threat from corpus juris, and we can probably talk about that in more detail, uh, perhaps at the question stage. But you know, we have seen uh, just what a dangerous place uh, that we live in, problems in the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine. But actually, this little island has had relative stability. I know that is threatened to an extent in a way that very few other parts of the world has. That has nothing to do with Europe and indeed is greatly threatened by the European Union. And then if we look at, um, in this particular survey by A.T. Kearney, it had New York as the world's global capital, London at uh, number two. I think that's wrong. I think London, this is the world's uh, global capital. I think there's little, little doubt about that. But that's an extremely privileged position for a country to have a, a place that uh, is, is as vibrant uh, as this, this city is. And again, that has nothing to do with the European Union. The next thing I wanted to talk about uh, was economics, trade and finance. And I think the picture, with, although there are problems, is, is pretty strong in, in this uh, regard as well. I think you're probably aware that the world is changing. Until about 2000, the reality is that uh, the only shows that mattered were America, Europe in the, in the wider sense. Uh, emerging markets were a very small part of the global economy. China was about 3% of global GDP. What has happened in the last 10 or so years is extraordinary. Emerging markets have gone to about 45% of the global economy, uh, and China will be larger than the European Union probably by about 2018. I think you've got to be careful with these statistics. There are a billion Chinese, more than, uh, and only 400 odd million Europeans, so they're not rich on a per capita basis, but the world is changing on a very, very rapid basis. Britain's market share, if that's the right expression in terms of the global economy, is fairly constant at, at, at about 3%. But what is also interesting is that the bloc that has formed most precipitously in power is, 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 is the EU. Uh, the, the, this red line here is steadily falling. And we contrast that with the United States. Yes, the US has also been slipping, but actually the US's share isn't much different to what it was in, in about 1994. That's partly down to much faster growth in the, in, in, in the US than in Europe. It's the, the European Union is well aware has seen a stagnation in growth, which I think is largely self-inflicted uh, over, over the last 10 years. It's down to stronger demographics in the states and a much more open economy. The world is changing, therefore the argument that Britain has to be part of this big club is becoming a very, very much weaker argument than perhaps it, it was. Now, let me just change the slide. Then if you look at uh, employment and tariffs, yes, there is some unemployment in Britain, but it's a relatively low in a European context degree of unemployment. That's the European Union average. European unemployment is roughly double. And as you're well aware in this room, uh, there is a tremendous divergence in, in, in the degree of unemployment across the European Union, direct result of the euro in my and many other people's opinions, with precipitous levels and instability that Bill was talking about in Spain, in, in, in Greece and Portugal, etc. But what's even more extraordinary and perhaps little less discussed uh, than the degree of unemployment is this employment growth. Between 2007 and 2012, all these European countries have seen a decline in the number of jobs. That's over a five-year period. And a number of them precipitously, Spain, Greece, Ireland, Croatia, have seen more than 10%, and in some cases 20% of the entire employment base eroded. And not only that, there's been a salary erosion, a deflation in salaries. There have never been more people working in Britain today uh, than there, there is now. So the UK, outside the Eurozone, has been able to grow pretty rapidly. And the CBI and others do argue that actually the talk of a, of a referendum uh, will cause instability and uh, people uh, will delay decisions. That has not been borne out by the reality of employment growth uh, to date. Another important point is that tariffs have been falling very, very significantly. The average tariff now of an American company importing into the European Union is 1.09%. Now clearly tariffs are higher on certain products, but that is the average. 
That is roughly a week's uh, volatility in, in currency markets. So we are actually moving slowly but surely towards a structure of much greater and more open global free trade. So the world has changed. The balance of trade is changing very rapidly. The cost of trading is, is falling. And Britain's employment is, is booming. Demographics. Europe isn't that big, actually. Uh, by 2050, this is Ian's chart, I think uh, European population will be about 7% of, of the global population. Sure, greater than Britain's. But uh, the reality is uh, that there's an awful lot of people out there out with the European uh, uh, Union. And if we look at uh, demographic projections, and I'm more than aware that uh, it's a very difficult thing to, to extrapolate, there's little doubt that the European Union's population is in structural decline, and that contrasts with the Anglosphere of the US and the UK, which is seeing some, some population growth. So Europe, I think, almost certainly will become a smaller part of Britain's trading relationship over the next 10 or 20 years. And we've estimated how that trend is going to change. At the moment, European trade accounts for about 40% or thereabouts of all trade that Britain uh, does. We think if we extrapolate what's happened over the last 10 uh, or, or so years, actually, the European Union will, will account for a little under 500 billion of trade uh, uh, compared with over 2 trillion of trade with the rest of the world. So that a slow but gradual decline in the importance of Europe and with that, Britain has to reconsider its relationships. This is a very interesting chart, again, courtesy of uh, Ian Mill here. This is looking at the growth in export markets over the last uh, 12 years. And this hasn't just been carefully selected, because actually Europe was growing quite strongly up to 2008. It may have been an illusion much of that growth, but it was in, in formal terms. So this includes a good period of growth. But all the growth are coming from places like China, Brazil, Thailand, South Korea, India, Turkey, Singapore. And then we come to Poland. And of course, Britain's trade with Poland is increasing, and a jolly good thing too. But Poland has come from a fairly low base over that period as its GDP has increased. So the balance of trade is shifting very, very quickly. Bill asked the, the, the question uh, about the deficit. Uh, and he's absolutely right. We run a very substantial deficit in our trade with the European Union but we run a small surplus with the rest of, of, of the world. I think that is partly down to the nature of our experts, which uh, uh, tend uh, not to be, they tend to be invisibles, they tend to be service related, and uh, the opportunity for uh, trade in, ter in, there's certainly no common market in services in Europe, for sure. There may be a manufacture of goods, but in terms of financial services and legal services, the uh, trade is, it is, it is it pinched quite significantly. But it's very, very clear, this is a well-known statistic, that we run a deficit with Europe and a surplus with the rest of the world. And I think that makes our negotiating position with the European Union uh, relatively easy uh, post-Brexit. It's said that we don't make anything any longer. And it's undoubtedly true that Britain's share of manufactured product has declined. But we're still one of the top ten manufacturing companies on earth. And uh, we are a net exporter in the motor industry, and that is absolutely the case at the high end of the motor industry. We're number two globally in aerospace, we're number two globally in pharmaceuticals. We have a strong position in foodstuffs, beverages, tobacco, <coughs> defence, maritime electronics. We've absolutely got a strong niche in, in, in website design, in fashion, etc., uh, etc. And, and actually, there are signs that Britain's manufacturing sector is coming back to life. It would be better if it was stronger, but we are still one of the top ten global players in manufacturing. As, uh, as Barry said, my background is in the city, uh, and uh, don't believe it, by the way, when you hear that everyone in the city is in favour of European Union membership. It might be true that some of those British sounding banks like Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank or UBS, uh, their leadership... Uh, might now be in favour, but there are very, very many people in the city who have significant reservations about the direction of Europe, and many support the, 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 the Brexit case. 
Uh, what I would say is that they tend to come from middle-sized companies. Many of them, these middle-sized companies are quite large. They, they, they may well have a market cap of half a billion pounds, which would be considered a middle-sized company. But there are lots of people in the city that have very significant reservations about the European Union. But what is true is that London and New York dominate the scene for global financial services. The city is worth about 50 billion on some estimates, I think probably more actually in terms of tax receipts. And I'm more than aware that it is open to criticism, but it's a critical strategic advantage that this country has. And what's more, we have a pretty large trade surplus, and most of that surplus is with America, uh, but it's also with a number of our European uh, neighbours as well. So this is a pretty critical industry. And London's domination of financial services in a European context is almost total. 74% of the interest rate market, 74% of the, the FX market, 85% of the hedge fund market, you can read the rest of that there. And I, I think it's European regulation, be it the financial transaction tax, uh, or, or be it the, the, the absurd increase in regulation over the last few years, is the greatest threat to the city. It's quite interesting that actually interest rates in Britain and America are identical, but the value of an annuity the, that you would get is about 1% higher in America than it is in Britain. A good proportion of that is down to EU regulation. So don't believe the city's in favour of the EU. Yes, Goldman Sachs and one or two others might articulate that view, but there are many, many city practitioners who take the opposite view, and I'm one of them. Britain's assets are highly uh, diverse. In actual fact, of our overseas investments, a little bit over 60% of our assets are out with the European Union. Fairly small proportion in the EU. So outside, if we choose to leave the European Union, actually this is a very, very global country. IT, well, when one thinks of IT, you think of uh, uh, Silicon Valley, you think of Apple, you think of Microsoft, etc. And it's true that Britain has not developed a company of that magnitude. But actually, we are a global ship leader, leading country in many aspects of, of IT. In terms of e-commerce, we are the, the leading nation. In terms of websites per thousand, we're, we're, we're absolutely up there and marginally ahead of the United States. And there's been phenomenal growth, particularly in the software end uh, of the market in, in, in IT uh, around Old Street and elsewhere which is a, a, a major spur for employment. And the, relative to our European neighbours, the UK's IT position is extremely strong. Um, partly as a result of a narrow no vote, uh, we can still put this slide up, uh, uh, which uh, shows that the UK has more than 50% uh, of the entire European uh, oil production, and we were one of the top 20 uh, global oil producers. So from an energy perspective, the UK, uh, relative to Europe, is in an extremely strong position and certainly not dependent on, on Russia. Power. Two aspects to power, hard power and soft power. Uh, you know as well as I do the size of the, the Royal Navy and the British Army has been shrinking. Uh, and without saying, getting into the debate as to whether it's appropriate to be sized or not, the reality is there's only one power, hard power show in the world, and that's the United States of America. But the UK is still in the top five. <coughs> and in the European context, our expenditure is the biggest, marginally bigger than France. And there are only two powers in Europe, in a military sense, that matter, who have the power to, uh, to, for expeditionary warfare, and that is Britain and France. The others either have uh, sort of local defence forces, uh, or really have fairly tokenistic uh, military. So in a, in a military context, Europe absolutely needs Britain. And I think despite the, the, the decline in Britain's military, we just need to remember actually that the UK's military still punches pretty strongly. We're one of only five deep uh, blue sea uh, navies. We have uh, nuclear weapons. We have a leading uh, intelligence network. We have diplomatic networks which are, are extremely strong. We have strategic assets, Cyprus being the obvious case. Uh, and uh, uh, while it is true that uh, uh, the size of the army and navy are, are very small, in terms of special forces, America has only got one person to turn to, and it's us. So if we choose to leave the European Union, 
Britain, in terms of a military perspective, is still in a fairly strong position. The most tedious complaint we hear, if we leave, is we would be isolated. Well, these are the list of international organizations, and by, I'm sure I've missed quite a few off that we are members of, uh, um, some of which are somewhat obscure, uh, and it's questionable whether we should be um, uh, members of, uh, but uh, the, 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 there are many, many significant, the United Nations Security Council, uh, a major seat at, at NATO, etc., uh, etc. Et Britain most certainly wouldn't be isolated. And actually, there's one, the World Trade Organization, we are a member, but we have no say in that organization at the moment because negotiations are carried out in the European Union. We could actually regain our position there and negotiate some sensible uh, treaties with, with our friends and neighbors. So when people say we're isolated, show them that chart. Now, soft power. Very hard to measure what uh, soft power is, but it is effectively the means to get your way without using military force in the most simple uh, term. So there's things like Hollywood being an example of soft power. It's about cultural imperialism. It's about diplomatic networks. It's about uh, uh, IT. It's, uh, there's a whole number of aspects to soft power. And it, it is subjective, this. But Monocle voted Britain last year, as, uh, which is seen as the arbiter of, of soft power, as uh, displaced America for the first time as the world's greatest uh, holistic power, if you like. Now, I think subsequently the last Monocle survey relegated us to number three. But the point is, whether we're first, second, or third, Britain has enormous global influence. And without getting into the debate on immigration, which uh, Global Britain has decided not to enter, save by saying it's a matter and has to be a matter for the British people. It is an interesting factor that people actually want to come and live here, and there's an example of the power and there's some of the advantages we are talking about uh, that this is such an attractive place uh, to, 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 come, to come and live. So, what I, I, I hope um, we've shown in these last uh, few minutes is that if Britain, as I hope it does, chooses to uh, to leave the European Union, this isn't going to be some small, irrelevant, isolated place. Far from it. In almost every aspect we look at, be it hard power, soft power, diplomacy, language, education, culture, sport, industry, IT, etc., etc., the UK is absolutely a market leading nation. And I think that, unfortunately, for reasons we could debate, that people have lost confidence, or many people, I don't think you have, have lost confidence. They've been told, they've been sold this idea of decline, this idea that the world no longer is pink in the map, has been translated to, to mean failure. It's not failure. Actually, this is a very, very vibrant place indeed. And I think we learned one thing from that odious character, Alex Salmon. It is, let's be optimistic. Yeah. And there's an awful lot of optimism here. Thank you very much.